From every corner of the earth sits glorious architecture, magnificent structures that allegedly have no connection, yet very similar designs. This style of architecture, riddled with elegance and purpose, can be found in your neighborhood or in the middle of nowhere. And when you walk in, you are overwhelmed with a vibrant feeling of serenity, a feeling that modern day architecture does not provide. The concept of a timeline that once existed, where structures were created with a completely different purpose. Yet, when we take a look back at who they told us built these structures, considering the timeline and the lack of technology, the story begins to crumble. And that story was taught to us all during a time when we were too young to question it. But when you shine an unbiased light upon the history books, you'll quickly uncover the lies of his story. But even before Rockefeller and his goons started the Board of Education, they already had our ancestors. And anyone who questioned their narrative would soon find themselves an unwilling resident of the original indoctrination camps. And where did they come from? Where did we all come from? If knowledge is truly power, then maintaining such power must rely on the absence of knowledge. Are you aware that every major city in America experienced a great fire? Candle fires that turned stone to dust, leaving behind a crime scene that resembles a war zone. Let's take a giant step back, perform our own investigations, question the history that was written by these victors. With a growing nationwide lack of trust for our leaders, it's time to discover the extent of the deceit and where the lie truly began. What's being kept from us is huge. And you know, talking earlier about the architecture, I really like to encourage people to do their research in their own communities because you really do not have to go far to start chipping away at what they told us and ask yourself a question, is this even possible? Is it possible that X building was built in the 1890s? And they're giving us timelines of like a year. <laughs> it was built in a year. They want us to believe we didn't have the technology that we were low tech, and yet we're building all of these amazing structures. This disparity between what the narrative says and what's actually there. You have places cities in America that look as though they were constructed in medieval Europe. When nothing was here and people showed up and just got started building from what we're told, one would assume that they would build with the means that were available to them. Wood, nails if they were lucky. What we get is this narrative that people were showing up and really making do with what they had. What we learn about in school is there was nothing here. This land was free for the taking. The only inhabitants were wild Indians, and we built everything here. Everything you see in this country, in North America, because we're talking about Canada too, was built by us after we got here, nothing here. They had to change the narrative. They had to destroy the evidence. They had to come up with an explanation for who built this, why they built it, when they built it. And they had to do that for a lot of buildings. We are told that during the 1800s, the consensus of North America was low, extremely low, too low to justify the infrastructure within the timelines they've provided, too low to have the experience or knowledge on crafting these glorious buildings. They're the most exquisite buildings I've ever seen and there was only a population of a few thousand people at that time. And then I'm looking and there's mud roads and wooden sidewalks. And then I'm looking at this building that is just, it could be out of Paris or Prague. It's not computing. And so I'm realizing there again, there's a whole bunch of stories that have to be dug into rethought, reconsidered, and in some cases, completely discarded. We no longer build like that. How does that happen in a realistic timeline? Wouldn't you be progressing year after year to have incredible buildings? Today, we would be building massive pyramids, massive courthouses, courthouses that last forever. Instead, 
We have the complete opposite. And they're very cheap. The tools have upgraded, supposedly. Yet, our construction has gotten worse. It's completely backwards. There's evidence of a, of a worldwide culture that existed in the not too distant past. And the evidence is, is everywhere. It's an interesting thing because like I've spent a lot of my life looking into ancient history and traveling around the world, searching into the past. And it isn't until recently that I realized that it's actually, I don't have to travel to Egypt or anywhere. It's all right there in Sydney and in London and in San Francisco, and it's all around the world. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. All you gotta do is look at the civilization you're living in with the right type of eyes, and you're sort of looking around your city and you're going, well, hang on, what's this building doing here? And why is there a building just like that in the Philippines? Why is there one in Japan? Apparently Japan's borders were closed, weren't they? Why are we finding what we're told is Greco-Roman style architecture in every country on earth? Was it really Greco-Roman style or is it evidence of a culture that existed, a worldwide culture that existed right around the world in the not too distant past? If I took a picture of this building behind me and asked any of these people, where do they think this building is in the world? I guarantee you most of them would say Rome or Europe somewhere. But no, it's right here in San Francisco. We have buildings like this all over the country and they want us to believe that they were built in the early 1900s or the late 1800s with horse and buggy. And there's just no way that's true. These buildings were built by the prior civilization, master builders, the old world order. This is the architecture I'm talking about. You'll find this in anywhere, in, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, Hong Kong, North America, South America, all over Europe, it doesn't matter where you are, this architecture is replicated. The weird thing is, they akin it to being all built around the 1870s to 1900 mark. So all of the world just shit out of nowhere at the same time, there was nothing before it. <laughs> Does it make any sense? I don't think um, antiquity is a long time ago. I think this civilization went just before us. You know, the Edwardians are supposed to be um, around the time of the First World War. So within grandparents' living memory, yet we know nothing about them. It's the control mechanism that covers it up with the education system. They got the news, they got the narrative, they got, you know, the mainstream to tell you how things are, but the reality is completely different. History goes to the victors, okay? Somebody invaded this place and took over a beautiful through jealousy, using trade, trade routes, using the sea, and they took over this place. They covered all of this fine architecture with their iconography. So there's literally been a cover-up of history more than one way. If you look at capital buildings all over the earth, they look the same. <laughs> They do, they've got columns, they've got domes. It was not random. And every story we're told in our historical narrative about how a place got started was some guy was the first settler there, bought some land, subdivided it, sold it, and pretty soon you have a city. But the whole narrative is based, especially in North America, that there wasn't anything there. And we built it all. You can look at it, the whole building was a work of art. So there was obviously some pride that went behind that. It wasn't just about making money and throwing shit up as fast as you could. It was about building with a purpose and that there was, there was symbolism behind these things. They built them to last. They built them with a certain level of artistry and attention to detail and customization. You see, now you'll go through a, a, a neighborhood and every home looks the same. This neighborhood, perfect example. <laughs> um, but everything had its own identity and it was steeped in customization and ornate attention to detail. We don't get that now. You don't get that now. Even when you look at the beauty of the buildings from that, that Tartarian here, if people were actually paying for labor, and you have to get carpenters in there. No, you'd never build buildings like that if you're working by the hour, an hourly rate. You'd just be getting it functional. People used to build that stuff because they love to build because beauty is actually a function. Beauty is actually a function of a creation. When you're living in a, in a world of beauty, you, your soul is, expands and it's expansive. You can create, you can become all that you can be. And if you can become all that you can be, you sure as hell don't need rulers. 
So that's why they don't want you to uh, know about any of this sort of stuff. No, no, we're at the pinnacle of our civilization now. This is the best it gets. The best we've ever done. Look at the quality of these walls. <laughs> hey, fuck that gothic shit. Look at this. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. When I was like eight years old, I started researching the pyramids and stuff because no one knew how they were built, you know? So I started looking into ancient history. And as I said, I'd spent most of my life traveling around the world looking at all these ancient sites. And then suddenly you see this civilization that's right there under your nose. It's been there the whole time in all of our Western cities. They covered everything up. It wasn't just inserting the dark ages, they changed everything. So when we start even trying to piece it together through the history that they've given us, how do we know any of these places are even the names that we're told they are? How do we know any of these things? How do we know any of the history is true? Because it's not they just put it all together and just shuffle the deck and throw it out to a bunch of countries and name them whatever they want. So it's become extraordinarily difficult to try to trace it through any mainstream history records. All we've got to, to really go on is the architecture itself. It wasn't thousands of years ago. It was just hundreds of years ago. Even if you go down to South America and look at some of the temples down there, the, the edges on them, the beveling on them, this is only a few hundred years old. This is not old ancient structures. These are new walls. I've gone there and looked at them myself. You know, nothing is what they tell us, you know, everything is a lie, it's just how big the lie is, you know, and the bigger the lie is, the easier it is for people to believe it. There's a lot of architecture in the world today, on every continent, of buildings that are much, much larger than you would think people of our height would build. And so I gave the example of the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. as being one of those buildings. Um, the Basilica, the National Shrine at Catholic University in Washington is another example. A huge, huge building. Look at the Texas State Capitol. It's incredible. You've got these pillars around the whole area. It's kind of the same thing as the Vatican. I do wonder about Iolani Palace. How old is it? And one thing to look at is it took them two years from 1880 to 1882, how did they build that beautiful, beautiful building? Was that building here longer? Was it here before Captain Cook? There's no construction pictures and there's none of that stuff. So no power tools, horse and buggy. How is that even possible? When you have St. John's Cathedral in New York City, that's not a style of cathedral. That's the real McCoy. Could you imagine that being built today? I think that everybody would go crazy. They have no legitimacy whatsoever, except to trick us and convince us that they do. And that's how they've managed to get away with this. So they could insert themselves in and set themselves up as overlords. Stone building is not just something you can pick up and teach a convict in a matter of weeks, like we're told about Americas and Australia. Truly, that's how we're told these countries were built. Just extremely sophisticated and technical engineering involved and you know there's so many questions that come to mind how they do it if they were our size how could they even accomplish this with the technology we were told we had at the time you'll find many of the banks post offices government centers, especially 100 years ago, were facilitated in these large, glorious stone structures. So number one, the rulers wanted the stronger, more durable, more imposing structures for themselves. That sends a message to the people you're ruling over. We're going to play a little game here with two alternatives, right? And you or I, whoever the person deciding between these two is, I'd like for you to pretend you're a world leader. You're not a good one. You're evil and you'd like to rule the people underneath your thumb. Or you're looking to maintain control over people. Bear with me and envision these two alternatives. In the first, we have the opinion, the theory, the teachings, the paradigm that man is nothing but a carnivorous monkey in outer space, floating on a rock for no reason in the middle of nowhere by accident. And this all got kicked off 43 bajillion years ago on a Tuesday at 6 o'clock p.m. And they can determine this with their 
color star charts and then, you know, uh, moon dust and things like that. And going on to a long, vast existence of nothing, just surviving by instinct, on par with an animal. Justification for any morals, ethics, no real pursuit of true happiness, no pursuit of harmony and understanding here on the earth. And this is all what we're living in today. There's no spiritual accountability. There's no understanding of beauty. Well, on the other alternative, on this side, we have a purposeful creation, a purposeful design to not only the human being, but the entire earth, the laws of nature. No theories, no theories, only laws ingrained into existence, woven into the fabric of reality by the designer, the creator, not in a linear sense, not, you know, back then, this many years ago or that. It doesn't work that way. This is the fabric of what we live in. There is a value placed on beauty. Why? Because God has a beautiful creation. In order to return the favor, mankind has an impulse to create beautiful things. In recent times, this has been robbed from us. But nonetheless, it's in the soul of every human being to not only value beauty, to seek it out, to place a high, high emphasis on it. This is how the ancients maintained their ways of life. Geometric, proportional laws of beauty. Well, they didn't tear all of them down. Not that they put them up in the first place. The World's Fairs showcase many of our ancient structures in their grandest form. Yet, we are sold the story that these are alleged temporary buildings, all being built in record-breaking time for the purpose of a worldly gathering, a gathering to showcase new technology, or perhaps just taking credit for the old. With so many lights on display, one would only assume that power plants and electrical resources such as wiring and even electricians were widely available. However, during this time period, that wasn't the case at all. Therefore, how were these vast areas in the late 1800s able to light the evening sky? Like a modern day theme park? Or was there a different method for harvesting energy? Now ask yourself, what part of these magnificent buildings look temporary? What part of these buildings look rushed? And most importantly, what part of these buildings look new? Or you can just believe these guys. With these World's Fairs, it was all brand new. This is what they tell us. It was meant to be temporary. So they used plaster of Paris and wood and all these other structures. And if you look at the pictures, that's not what you see. You see these massive masonry structures that look like what you see in Europe. They have these places like Chicago, Omaha, Portland, Seattle, Guatemala. They had them in Tasmania. Georgia, Louisiana, Ohio, Canada. Each one of these fairs, each one was built in two years or less. Each one was magically populated by millions of people that came from all over the realm to participate in this event. They started with the Crystal Palace Exposition in 1851. So what they tell us in nine months, they, from you know the moment they conceived of it to when it was built, it was nine months of getting it all together in this gigantic plate glass structure with fountains and trains and all the bells and whistles. Now supposedly they moved that entire structure to a different location in London in 1854. And that in the 1930s, that burned down. So you show pictures of this Crystal Palace structure, which is massive and all the things that are there. Up, oh, we up and move that, no problem. Oops, it burned down, <laughs> which is 
typically what happened to a lot of these World's Fair structures. If you can erase it from history, people don't see it as a potential future. And I think that in itself is, for me, the moral of hiding history, about hiding the old world. It just doesn't make logical sense to me to build something so grand and then just destroy it. Really, those was an excuse to take existing infrastructure, build some little bullshit around it, and then when you're finished with your so-called fair, it gives you an excuse to tear everything down and nobody questions you. They might have built a couple of these buildings, and you can actually tell the buildings that they built because they look like dog shit. Now, we have buildings that can hold 10,000 people, huge, giant buildings that look like they were made for a larger race of people. Where they say they built it in two years, 600 acres, which is, I think, something like 27 million square feet. It's absolutely insane, the amount of architecture they say they built in two years. As an architect, and somebody who's been building my entire life, designing houses and buildings for 20 years or so. The time frames that they allow for just the planning, the idea that that could just be planned out in two years begs credulity. They had these ornate buildings with all kind of moving sidewalks and, and crazy technology. They had ill things with so many lights, electricity, when electricity was supposed to be a new thing and all of that. They had shit that was like something out of a dream, bro. Well, this is the exposition. They were fully electrified. You know, some of these examples, so this, they were electrified before electric was a thing. You know, the first electrified city was supposed to be Buffalo. first electrified building was supposed to be J.P. Morgan's in New York, all attributed to um, Edison. But these things, you know, some of the 1890s, fully electric, and it would have been free energy. They didn't have massive plants to generate electricity. The first one in America was in 1876, and that was the Centennial World's Fair in Philadelphia. The one in 1901 in Buffalo was a major one. The 1904 in St. Louis was the Louisiana Purchase, and then the Lewis and Clark was in Portland the following year. If you define the word exposition, it's telling a story. It's setting the stage, the narration. So these World Spheres were used as, this is the narrative that we want people to believe and go home with. The World Fairs served to get people with the new program. They said, trains, incubator babies, this is the new norm. Fast forwarding people into the modern industrial age. Everyone's wearing the same beaver hats. Everyone's wearing the same three-piece suit. You know, it seemed like individuality had ceased to exist. The World's Fairs served the purpose of indoctrinating. The World Columbian Exposition was one of the most superb. In Chicago, Illinois, formerly known as Chilaga, had some of the most beautiful stone masonry in the world. The area was nicknamed the White City as each building was strategically painted bright white in an attempt to hide the inevitable aging of the structural entity. The mainstream narrative would lead you to believe that these megastructures were designed by the most educated and experienced architects. Right? The architects, you didn't have any formal training. What on earth would give you that idea? Isn't that what the website said, right? <laughs> Your website. Your website said that the architect of this building has no formal training. That's... Here. I find that implausible. This is your website. We all do. That's why so I probably, I'm not sure if there were even any schools of architecture back then. How did they know how to do this? Though? That's all we're asking. This is not built for dinosaurs, the Field Museum. It was built for something else. It's not to show off the fake dinosaur bones. It was for something else. When you walk inside, you can see the doors are much bigger than the size we are. It's nothing like what we build today. The Museum of Science and Industry, which was the arts building, the fine arts building, and they make the argument that that was a temporary building like all the others and the public liked it so much that they rallied to save it so what they did is they went and rebuilt it out of granite and marble and copper and all the permanent materials that we see now i think these are children's stories that they give us i don't understand at all how serious-minded people 
can accept the story that says this building was built exactly as we see it now, but with temporary materials. And then because we liked it, it got rebuilt out of granite and marble and copper and, and glass. To me, that defies explanation and is much more of a fanciful tale than the idea that the building was already there and was repurposed for a fair. This one connects to the Shedd Aquarium, I guarantee it. And it connects to a lot more buildings around this area. And it's not just here, it's in every single city in the world. You know we on top of water. We're on water. We on water. So we on top of water. You go in the basement, you will hit a water, hit the wall. And then sometimes when it rain, because the sewer be flooded sometimes, the water come in the basement, flood the whole basement. Oh my God. <laughs> Thoughts on that? That's exactly what we're talking about. Before we leave it, press them on that. What do you got on that? Okay, so there's a massive tunnel system throughout all of these buildings yeah. everywhere in the world. Yeah. So you're telling us right now that there's tunnels Basically, there's a basement here. This building is much bigger than we than we can see on the yeah, it's ground a surface. It's a basement. It's a basement here. And when the war, you hit. When you go in the basement, we do rounds. What we call our rounds called the ground level, and then we got upper level. Okay. So we go downstairs to certain hallways. You will hear water hitting the hitting the walls. Wow. You uh, have seen the tunnel systems underneath these buildings. According to the information gathered from my grandfather, who got here in Chicago in 1969, well, before that. As far as for what we have here from what we museum we're in now from the Field Museum to the Shed Aquarium to Soldier Field, there's a there are the pathways underneath that are all connected. It's like if you go to McCormick Place, if you go they got the little tunnels over there too, because they be flooding over there too. Really? Um, yeah. So it's connected, you think? Yeah, yeah. So this whole campus, the whole campus is connected. And we guess tunnels, I was told there's tunnels, you know what I'm saying? It's like the tunnels on along the lake that you can go down there. And then it leads you into like a little path, but you know that's I heard that from some somebody that he was he was working for uh, 43 years. Really? Been here for 43 so years. He been here for 43 years. He retired. I want to say like last week sometime. Have you ever been in them? No, sir. No. They won't allow access to the public. Okay. And then they only allow access to very very few of their actual workers here. So you think that dirt in that picture downstairs? You think the dirt is actually there, and we put it there there to cover up this building to make it look like it's not as big as it really is? Mm. That's a good one. That's good. I feel like we did though. I feel like he he put the he made the picture to fake like I feel like the building was here already. What do you tell your child when you're when you're coming to a to a new location and they're asking you questions and you have no answers? You will start to create so that way you have a way to answer those questions or your child will grow up with no answers and, and forever seeking. So now we're here to give answers. There you go. When they say that these buildings were temporary, what they're basically suggesting is that it's a full-scale model that is going to be occupied by thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that are coming in and out of these fairs, where they're going to hold together through brutal winters, through hurricanes, through potential earthquakes, with hundreds and thousands of people occupying these spaces. The liability on that alone would have shut the whole endeavor down from the beginning. It wouldn't have been permitted. It's not the kind of thing that's permissible when you're talking about uh, the building trades, when you're talking about a public facility where you're gonna be bringing so many people. Now, this takes a huge infrastructure and it takes a huge amount of people to do something like this. When you see these ridiculous construction photos where it's like popsicle sticks, clear manipulation. All right, so right here you can see they're doing, they just put the scaffolding up just like they've done in the past in the original pictures of the construction. Yeah, and they're doing it right now. How hard would it be to just make it black and white and then make it look like they're doing some construction right now? NASA's not the only company to fake a photo, guys. With a lot of these old, glorious buildings, regardless of where they are, you'll find supposed, alleged, construction photos. Now, many of these will show simply scaffolding around an already constructed building. If you take an old cathedral and put scaffolding around it, and you're the first person ever to have that cathedral photographed, well, you are ripe to make a case for yourself that you may have built that to begin with, whereas you might have just been renovating that cathedral, repainting it, fixing it. Old, primitive photo manipulation techniques. Wooden sidewalks and mud roads, you have to be able to bring 
all the stone and brick and glass and copper and all the component parts, you have to be able to bring that to the site. And so just the roads alone, like you can scratch and sniff any aspect of this and the story starts to crumble. But if you're printing these in books or you're presenting them like on a, maybe a TV documentary, let's say, and it's just an image that's going to come and go in 99.9 .9, right, percent of people looking at them are not even going to scratch their head. They're going to just say, well, there it is. There's the construction photo and I don't need anything else because why would I question that? That's absurd. Also, you'll find good old fashioned cut and pasted, you know, someone with an X-Acto knife out in a early primitive dark room slapping together photos that actually don't belong together to begin with. This technology of its day was a sure way to make multiple images and combine them into one. There was no way the rewriters wouldn't need this for faking construction pictures. And no, it's not Photoshop, but the layering process is very similar. Victorian photography manipulation, using pencil markings and scraping techniques to draw, erase, and touch up any image desired. The easiest way to achieve your goals is to have a white background that you can remove later in the darkroom. Not uncommon for others to create trick photography and show off their masking and etching skills. For back then, this was the cutting edge of the start of this fraudulent society they've built. They take an already completed building and they whitewash the skies. They call it vanilla skies. They'll blotch out the sky and cut away from what they want to leave in the photo. They can cut away what was there and replace it with a gray or white vanilla colored sky. Vanilla sky, where the background is cut out and you can see the crop marks, you can see, you can zoom in and see where the edge of the building just, there's a little bit of a blurry edge. The sky that would have been the background has been vanilla disappeared. Sky. It's like, well, why would they do that? If you see one construction photo that's off where they've painted in scaffolding, or they've taken out backgrounds, you have to stop. Why did they go to the extent to do this? You have to ask a question. And if you see hundreds of photos that are done this way, you have to realize this was an industrial scale effort to create a narrative. Exquisite masonry buildings were built in one or two years. These take time. I mean, you put one or two years just into the planning. Well, before that, you have the engineering piece. You have the design. You're not just getting a bunch of artists and builders together and knocking these things out. There's architects involved, so there's the design. Then there's the engineering of it. All of this takes time. These buildings are years in the making. And especially when you're crafting every single corner of it, like what we're seeing, we're seeing every doorknob Every cornice over a window is celebrated. And this is what, why the architecture is so beautiful. It's, a, it's an architecture of celebration. You have to ask yourself this. Why is there such a lack of construction photos from the inside of the buildings? The outside's incredible, but the inside is built like a palace. There's such a lack of photos from the inside of these buildings. And they're incredible. When you have the Kleksinski building in Chicago that took 14 years, and then you come back and you look at the one before that, the federal building, built in seven years. How is that possible? They're not gonna be able to bring these things all the way up to the top, get these people that have no training and actually create this amazing thing that lasts forever. In a timeline where they tell you they were riding around on horses and wagons, where this should not be accepted. It's just not gonna happen in the amount of time that they're telling us. We know people cook the books in other areas. We know people have manipulated photos for the sake of deceiving people, just like NASA does. This isn't a new thing. It's an old thing, but it's still being done today. You find photo manipulation. Now, CGI, the techniques have developed substantially, but back then, they thought they were at the cutting edge. They didn't think that they would be caught on to. Or maybe they didn't care. Like, by the time they figure this shit out, who cares? We'll be long gone and who cares? They have their stories. Everything, everything has something to explain it. 
within the last 100 to 200 years. I even called the Illinois State Archives building and they didn't have information on their own courthouse that's located within one mile of itself. Illinois State Archives, how may I help you? Hey, um, I was just transferred to you because I was looking at the Supreme Court when it was built and I was just trying to find like records on it and it said it was saying like on their on their website it was saying that it was built in like a year. So I was just trying to figure out if that was true or not. Um, I would con have you tried contacting the Supreme Court? Yeah, and they sent me over to you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know what we would have on the building itself. Let me look here. Yeah, it was saying on their website that it was, the keys were given over on February 4th, 1908, but 1908, they also said that they were moving out of the other old, the old state capitol building, so, I don't know, two months, it doesn't sound right. Yeah, that sounds kind of odd. Um, let's see here. I don't know if we have anything on the building itself. The stories that we've been told are basically just that, they're stories that we're repeating over and over and we're just regurgitating what they've been telling us. You could either choose to believe it or you could choose to research and see the truth that these are buildings from the past civilization. I'm standing in front of the sunken ship parking garage which is in the exact spot as the Occidental building. Now the Occidental building was built supposedly in 1882 and was destroyed in the Great Fire. That was that giant masonry, massive, three, four thick wall of just solid brick and stone that was somehow burned down in a fire. So this is what the modern era rolled out for us. We have the sunken ship parking garage, which is just kind of a, a thumb in the nose of this world that we're living in now. Yeah, salt in the wound but I think it's just good that we remember the past and know what used to be there and the glory of the old world as it was. On a lot of these old glorious structures, you'll start seeing old cheap banners, signs just kind of get slapped on to these old glorious stone buildings. They simply don't fit together. These buildings were not intended to become money-driven establishments and those they kept turned into such. It's funny that we never hear through the passing down of generations stories regarding any of the difficulties a nation would face building a magnitude of stone and brick palaces. Why are none of our grandparents or great-grandparents ever speaking highly of these buildings? If they were truly built in the early 1900s, do you think one of our grandparents would have been like, yeah, I was at the site and I'm so proud of building that, or my friend, I knew somebody and he was over there building that building. Not one time. Does that sound odd? In order to build some of these buildings in a year, you'd have to have hundreds of people, like daily, sleeping there. You'd have to have people with houses located on site because they got their horse in their wagon. Are they traveling home at night? Where are these horses staying during the day when they're building these buildings? And it's just, the story doesn't add up. If it was really truly built, like they say, then there would be so much proof and Sorry, but saying that a photo wasn't available or hard to take back then, that's just not, that's not gonna yeah. cut it. You've taken a photo before, why couldn't you take another one? They transported all these materials from hundreds of miles away, and it got there perfectly, there was never an issue. It just isn't logically possible. As an architect of 20 years, I have a pretty good understanding of how materials react to the elements over time. Modern infrastructure of Seattle is at best 140 years old. There's no room in that narrative for a building to be showing the type of weathering that we're seeing beyond. So just to me, that one building alone is further evidence that this city was here for a long time. To me, it's been there for centuries. I would give this building 300 years. I like to look at a building as telling its own story. I'd like to say that stones don't lie. Stones are always going to tell you the truth. And if you look at it through that lens and you let it tell its own story, then something else emerges entirely. There are blocks, stones used in some of the constructions of places like Machu Picchu, even St. Augustine, Florida, just sitting there, a hewn stone 
that no amount of men could have dragged. It would have taken something larger, something more technologically assisted. That is, of course, unless we're talking about people of substantial size. In many ancient books all over the world, they speak of giants that existed and alongside what we would call regular sized people now. People who were larger might have had an easier time hauling, hewning, placing, arranging stones of this size that we see in the megaliths of the Americas, that we see in the megaliths of the whole world, may have been the result of giants. You know, if you're using critical thinking, it just doesn't make any sense as to why build at such a large scale for people our size. That's the weirdest part, is when you have doorways in random buildings that are too big, they're, way, they're 20 feet high. Why would you build a door frame that's 20 feet high for a population that is so small? Why would a regular sized human, not just why, but how would a regular sized human make something so massive? It just boggles the mind. Why do six foot men and five foot women need that? We don't do that. We build door frames that are proportionate to our size. It just absolutely huge. Right, right, there's no sense. No sense whatsoever. Church is exactly the same now, just massive doors. It's just like you go through a little door here to get anything. I noticed uh, when I was in Europe last, they had some doors that took photographs of, and the lock on the door is up here. Yeah, the taller people. You have these door frames that are in stone. You can't take them away. And they're 20 feet in the air or taller. And then you have our door frame that we build inside of the door frame so that we fit through normally. We're much shorter than they were as a civilization. Think about it. You'd have to be a fucking moron to build a door that's 30 or 40 feet high if you're six foot tall and you can't even reach the doorknob. Across this plane, we find much evidence, abounding evidence, of giants, not only in the major city centers of this world, but in the burial mounds and ancient ruins of the old world. And what you find around the major city centers is giant doorways. We had giant books. We had giant helmets. We had giant knives, giant samurai swords, giant rifles. We had giant shoes. We had giant crowns. We had giant typewriters, giant belts. Giant this and that, things that don't seem suited for the average sized person, even on the taller side. It just doesn't make sense. And to think that large communities of people got together and built structures that were excessive, costly to begin with, but then you're adding the factor that they're building for a greater size than they need. It's not very cost efficient. It's not in line with what we're told about frontier America. So even just compared to me, right, in terms of a hip placement, my knee is up here and I'm 5'11". So these are really large individuals, really large individuals. And then when you think about it, it's not even that big of a deal, really. Like, what's the big deal if there was giant people? I mean, I've seen some of the unearthings of skeletons of giants and all this type of shit. Like, and what's so funny is, you know, people will dismiss giants, even though there's a myriad of evidence to, it, at the very least, suggest that they existed, right? 
but there's nothing that would even suggest that dinosaurs <laughs> fucking existed. And y'all motherfuckers believe in them, okay? If you were to find giant bones like that. Oh, give me that. That's just a, yeah, yeah. That's the femur of a, of a velociraptor. Get the fuck out of here. This is bullshit. The Smithsonian Institute has the bones. They've found this at Cohequia. And there are articles saying that they took these bones from St. Louis area and put them in the Smithsonian Institute. They're not telling us that they have them. When really we know they're either in the basement or they destroyed them or threw them away. There's so many news articles from the 1800s and the early 1900s of them destroying or disposing of these bones into the ocean. They had to cover it up. There's no room for giants in their new world. And they have to lie to us about it. They had to write the storybooks telling us that we came from monkeys. I think everything was bigger. I think everything was much bigger. I think there was more oxygen in the air. The trees were much bigger. The places were much bigger. They were better. They had all the technology. These people may have left or may have been killed off. My opinion is that they went for more land. I don't think they're allowed to be here. I think this is all an operation to repopulate this place and to be controlled by the leaders, so-called leaders. If you go back to the biblical scriptures, when the Nephilim came about from the fallen angels breathing with the daughters of men, they bore giants. It's in black and white, it tells you. Yep. There's plenty of evidence physically we had a race of giants. We are not that race. We are a different race. Yeah. We are a different set of people. I think we were cohabiting. I think they were doing the same yeah, thing. They they, most of them played basketball. Yeah, yeah man. Well, that's it. They're in the well, in the kind of blood trotters undercover, aren't they? Talk of the Nephilim uh, going into, you know, having sex with regular people and creating some sort of mutants and all of this type of shit. Training Shaq's grandpa. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Big ass tall. Yao Ming's Listen, grandpa. <laughs> you know, yeah. We see a lot of tall people in the NBA and all of that. Is this a remnant in the DNA? It's a fact that there were giants. It's not a conspiracy theory. I mean, we have proof of this. What makes more sense? You have a civilization that's short and tiny and riding around on donkeys, or you've got a tall, very strong population that's smart and capable and have experience that are building these cathedrals and basilicas. The places that are built are massive. It's proportionate to their size. You find skeleton after skeleton exhumed from the mounds of America, from the mounds of Florida, South America, go over to Mesopotamia and you'll find the same thing. Giant people buried under the ground. And these were whole races. These were not, you know, one guy who gets gigantism by accident. There's still giant skeletons, giant skulls that are being uncovered randomly. And the push is really to completely discount that and say, nope, not true. But the 19th century is full of the findings of giant bones. Didn't happen a long time ago. This happened recently. Human history is framed as to convince the average Joe that all of the luxuries, the benefits, the technological advances in their life, all of those things are the mere fruits of the industrial age and an industrial way of life, and the banking systems that followed, the methods of travel that became cemented after the industrial age. In the 1800s, all of the world's inventions just shit out of nowhere, okay? So you got like literally everything from the underground railway to the railways, the transport system, modern shipping, the modern trades, banking, the whole thing, everything just arrives you know, around maybe the 1850 mark. When records started, coincidentally, because all of our birth records were never official until 1850. Before then, they were in church parishes and they were highly controlled, as is the information in the church. So nobody can really look that far back into, you know, into the past to find out their ancestry. We are convinced that to be human today is a result of ingenuity in the industrial age. This is not true.
another element of history they've conveniently helped you forget about. A luxurious form of travel that was promptly removed from our skies. Airships are the oldest form of air travel. They're the most time-tested. Now, they've been taken out of circulation. A lot of people have the false impression, misconception that if you were traveling on an airship, you would be confined to the little cabins that were suspended from the bottom. You know, like the pilot's cockpit. You'd probably feel a little iffy about those coming down, being on the bottom of the ship. It's coming down, you look like you're gonna get smushed. Well, that big blimp is not just a balloon. In many, many airships of the old world, you had access into that large cavity of the blimp. And there were restaurants, there were bars, there were dance halls, things like this. This is all a matter of fact. Why would they build such a big thing and not put anything inside? So it's basically like a cruise, but a comfortable cruise where, you know, you're not sitting in the bottom part of the airship where they normally show you on a blimp. You're sitting in the airship. It's a beautiful place. A beautiful, easy, graceful method of travel flush down the drains. They're actually safer than airplanes. And what we had was a mass media event in the form of the Hindenburg, which actually scared most of the world's population away from ever getting in an airship again. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it. It's first under flight. Get it started. Get it started. It's right. It's right. It's terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's running, bursting into planes, and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's right. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just speeding around it. I told you, I can't even talk to people who are around there. It's, 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 oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it just laid down massive smoking wreckage. <laughs> and everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I'm sorry. I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Johnny, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't. Uh, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Oh, no. Can't do this. They're dangerous with the footage of the flaming Hindenburg, you know, falling out of the sky. Nope, no more airships. But there's a lot of evidence, shall we say, that's available to show that, yes, there were airships and they were a pre-existing technology. And one of the ways that they get rid of things is to say, like, it's unsafe, safety hazard, we can't do this anymore. And I don't want to be flying in that again because there's just fire up in the air and there's no way I would ever travel in that again. So I'd rather pick to be on an airplane. Let's stick with our helicopters and our airplanes and we're gonna can airships. What's a more tranquil form of travel? Airship or airplane? You can't tell me that everyone isn't terrified getting up on that tarmac and taking off on an airplane. On an airplane, you're stuck. You've got 60 to 100 people stuck on this little plane. You can't travel that far with the tanks that they have. With an airship, you can travel very far and you can travel with a lot of people. You could take mass amounts of people to these other lands that are much further than we could ever imagine. The airships of Germany were touching down in Opelaka, Florida for years. And Glenn Curtis, the man who opened up that Opelaka airport, is a man embroiled in scandal 
So if anyone's telling lies here, it's, it's those guys. Glenn Curtis was nicknamed fastest man alive for breaking top speed records on a motorcycle using gas engines. And he helped push gas as superior to steam and other techniques. He started slapping gas engines on airships too, and he helped get them off of other methods. Then he did the same thing with airplanes in direct competition with the Wright brothers. He tried to steal the Wright brothers' patents with the help of the Smithsonian. Towards the end, they started filling them with dirtier gas, trying to get them to be gas propelled. That was not the case. Many of these were steam, in some instances, just like a submarine. They can try and hide this from us a little bit, but you, the viewer, can go and look this up for yourself. The blimps were a lot more sophisticated than we're told. And going back to the comparison between airplane and blimp, they can literally and metaphorically bottleneck the costs of travel by only allowing so many people on to this tiny little tube that's traveling so fast so dangerous. We'll let this go by. Speaking of uh, modern day airplanes, you can only fit maybe a couple hundred onto an airplane when you could fit a couple thousand onto an airship. Number one, it's graceful, but number two, you can fit way more people. You can have way more facilities on that. It's like almost like a traveling city. So the airships provided something that airplanes don't. They were safer in terms of the speed of travel, you know, the danger of landing somewhere you're not supposed to. To think, if your fear of flying is caused by open waters, in the case of an emergency, you would now have a way to safely dock on a boat, and a fear of landing could be comforted by a slow docking airship. Things like the Eiffel Tower, which we were told was built for a World's Fair, but there's Eiffel Towers everywhere. Uh, this will give you an opportunity for a balloon to come in to your city and Mull around and you get straight out and it delivers you to the place where you, where you, uh, where you want to be. Now, I don't think this is beyond the bounds of possibility. They actually did it. Hindenburg used to couple up to the top of the Empire State Building. The doorway would come out, gantry would come out, and everyone would climb out of the Zeppelin into the Empire State Building. And they've done it in LA, in Chicago. These balloons were the transport of the day. Believe it or not, it was not uncommon for people to fly their airships straight into downtown New York City and to dock those airships in the steeples, in the finials, the towers, the spires of places like New York City, Chicago, major cities in Germany, England, you name it. Airships were docking. They would offload people into the tippy tops of buildings. I think that there was more than just airships. I think that the technology goes further than that. I think that these things were much more powerful. And I think that they went further than we can ever imagine to lands that we're not told about. Behind the scenes, they are still making these, but we wouldn't have access for making our own. If you wanted to build an airship today, you can't because NASA owns 99% of the helium. The tech back then, was possibly even more than what we have now. There's videos in the 1930s, 1940s of hoverboards and portable scooters that ran off of electricity. They used to have self-parking cars. Right when in photography was invented, you have these electric trolleys running wireless around cities. 20 years later, they'd all be breaking down, then went on to wires, then went on to the slower Edison electric grid. And remember that they have much, much more than what they're giving us. They are slowly giving us back the technology that was once here, that they found from the previous civilization. It's funny, right? Because they drop it back in doses, pretend like they're the heroes to reintroduce it. But meanwhile, that very thing that was designed to create freedom and creativity within humanity is now spun to be used for manipulation and control. But it's dropped in those doses where we just accept it and the line gets pushed further and further and further and people just sit back and they're just like, this is life.
wireless energy powered by the ether existed way before big oil. We all know how dirty the oil companies are, but to think about the things we could have if they never existed. An oil refining process was invented in 1854 by somebody in Pittsburgh. By 1870, John Rockefeller and Henry Flagler established the Standard Oil Company. And so it was like they needed to get a replacement energy source as quickly as possible. And they got it from this mining of resources. Back in the 1800s, mainstream academia had 18 additional elements on the periodic table of elements, ether being one of those, right? And somewhere along the line, when Albert Einstein came out with his theory of relativity and started doing lectures across the country and the world, that anybody that spoke about ether at that time was completely like their reputation was destroyed they lost their laboratories they lost their teaching jobs like what we saw in 2020. a lot of times they'll leave the breadcrumbs a lot of times the truth is in plain sight so with that benjamin franklin sending up the key on the kite that's essentially you the average american sending up their drone with a copper wire and harvesting electricity straight from the ether I think that the ancients understood very well that the ether is real and that there's ways of channeling atmospheric energy, earth energy, and I think that they built their buildings with this in mind. If we had access to free energy, I mean, imagine if you could just walk in, into the forest anywhere you want and you could just put up a little device and a resonator and you could build yourself a castle and just do it, lev levitate stones and just, just create a kingdom. Well, that's not very good for Joe Biden. How's he going to tax you? How, how's FEMA going to work with you in that situation? And how, you know, that's why it's so dangerous to them. That doesn't work when you're introducing an electric system that is dependent upon a power source, a bunch of wires, meters, and your output that you're having to pay for, where you become dependent on a system of scarcity. This old way of doing things was based upon a system of abundance and plenty because there's no end of the energy that's all around us all the time. There's another way of doing things. We don't have to live in this way of constant crisis because of constant scarcity. We can break through it and I think that we're on the verge of rediscovering this knowledge at a very curious time where the old system is actually falling apart. Everyone knew there was an ether. Most buildings were constructed in that manner until they came in and started destroying things and indoctrinating us. You go through and you start finding these correlations. You start finding how the free energy worked, what the power stations were, how all these places have got these certain buildings and fountains and certain copper top roofings and, and all the stuff for landing sites, for flying machines. And you start to see that all of this stuff is way too similar all around the world for there have not to have been a single culture. Many times these towers held old world technologies, uh, such as bells, which would send out resonant frequencies into the community beyond. So many photos of bells being rounded up all over Europe. We're living in a time where we're waking up to what we so recently had. The pipe organ is a healing machine. That's why it was integral to the construction of ancient Gothic cathedrals. The organ was the centerpiece of the church, of the cathedral. Now, around the building, up, down, around, beneath, you had pipes and essentially speakers blasting this music into the cathedral. They placed these, these beautiful organs, at these stained glass windows, which were treated with lens and specific properties. And these, and they, they were like car speakers. They augment the resonance and the sound out into the ether outside. So everyone outside in the community is, is invigorated, is on a higher state of consciousness, literally being the best they can. And you can see it in the pictures of these people in the day. Everyone is healthy. Anyone who's been around for a full volume, live, authentic pipe organ performance will tell you your bones rattle, your organs start to respond. 
your hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Walk into a well-made stone cathedral. Hear the pipe organ. Sit there and saturate in the healing frequencies yourself. Cathedrals are something beyond just a center for worship. They are healing machines. And the pipe organ of the cathedral is just one tiny little finger of this whole realm that we're talking about. You've got star forts, which I call a gateway topic because the same structure exists all over the earth, have been given to us as fortifications that were built for these different wars, which made them military targets. And so they have an excuse for why it was built in whatever location. And then they have a, an excuse for why it was destroyed. So in school, we learn about one fire. We learn about the Chicago Great Fire. In the case of the Great Chicago Fire, there was a lot of fanfare over Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over the lantern. The legend is that Mrs. O'Leary's cow in a barn kicked over a lantern and that caused the entire fire. And poor Mrs. O'Leary and her family had their lives ruined because of this. We only learn about Chicago. And I remember going to summer camp and we're sitting around the campfire and it's one dark night when we were all in bed. Bum, 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 bum. Old Miss Leary took a lantern to her shed and when the cow kicked it over, she turned around and said, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Fire, fire, fire. And we would yell fire louder and louder with each verse. And we do this like 10 times to where it was echoing back to us across the lake. And now when I think about it, it's like how many kids growing up in America were singing this song about this stupid story. What I realize is that it's like an incantation and it's spell casting. Where, where did this song come from? It's a story that they wanted the population to come to embrace and believe as part of the founding mythos of the country and who we are as a people. Well, lo and behold, as an architect with the keen interest in history, I come to find out only within the last few years that there were fires in every major city. And then I come to find out that it's not just wooden shanty town built out of matchsticks. We're looking at city after city after city with photographic evidence showing masonry buildings of the most exquisite type. Philadelphia, New York, Boston. You come down to Florida, Jacksonville, Miami. Every major city at one point was burned to the ground. Believe it or not, these were stone cities. These were megalithic stone cities, ancient metropolises that were burned down as if they were made from wood very quickly. Now we can speculate as to what the source of that destruction was from above, from below, arson, you know, biblical destruction, you name it. Nonetheless, every major city in America, if not Europe and the entire world, saw a great devastation by a fire. You'll see pictures of people walking on the sidewalk like no big deal. I mean, that's subjective, but I mean, that's what it looks like. The pictures are, are strange. The sequence of events that are supposed to have taken place are strange. So, you know, there's just a lot of clues, if you will, that these weren't random events like somebody wants us to believe. If you look at photos of even the buildings that still exist of the old world, they always give a backstory for why they took them down but it's just curious why so many towers are missing now. And so Pioneer Square is one of those examples. And this was built in the immediate aftermath of the fire in 1889 is curious because it appears on a real estate map from before the fire in a fully and intact form. In order for stone to burn down, it has to reach 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. House fire reaches the temperature of 1000 degrees, that's half. It's impossible for any stone building to be burning down. The 1800s and earlier fires may have been fake. They try to explain away multiple buildings with fire stories and, and multiple courthouses built on the same site in just a year with the same architect, and they're just demolishing these buildings. This is exactly why my fireplace right here 
is made of brick and stone because it doesn't melt. You gotta be an idiot to think that, that these forest fires are gonna be melting brick and stone. Use your head, guys. As they are busy dismantling it in the 3D reality that we experience, it was part of a program to dismantle the old world and shock us into an acceptance of basically the new world order. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today about the new world taking shape around us, about the prospects for a new world order now within our region. It's the new order, Babylon banging down your door, the war pigs hungry for war. We rally the troops and red sword once and for all. It's the new order. Babylon begging for your soul. They come and then they want control. Yeah, they come. We burn their system to the floor once and for all. Listen, it's, it's time to wake order. the fuck up. So you had what I would call the reset of history, according to. A very specific narrative. I mean, it didn't change very much. And using the media like they do today to publish it, print it, this is what happened, these are all the details, these are all the people involved, we got it down on record. So again, they're saying, okay, everything was built out of wood, like a Hollywood movie set. Didn't hold up, it caught fire. So we came in and we built all of these beautiful structures to make sure they wouldn't burn down again. And that is told repeatedly. You look at any major city, they suffered this same fate. And I don't think it's a simple matter of, oh, they were just so stupid. They didn't know, they put candles all over the place and let their cities keep setting on fire. The stone courthouses, the stone banks, into smithereens. Now in Jacksonville, we actually had a fire where there are first-hand accounts of people who were escaping the fire, and once they thought they had escaped to a, a safe distance, were watching the fire, because that's what people used to do back then. You wasn't much of a fire department. They just said, well, it's, it's burning. Just time to take photos and watch. And what they actually did was they were sitting up on a hill watching Jacksonville burn. They said that things on their persons started spontaneously combusting pocket watches, buttons, things that were made of certain materials were combusting. This was happening back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Cities would spontaneously combust with no sufficient cause, no suitable explanation. But they're in a covered carriage. What happens? Materials on their body are still spontaneously combusting, out of nowhere, sparking into flames. Now, how could that be the case if this is a local fire spreading to anything that it touches? These people were hundreds of yards away, if not more, from the fire. There weren't embers falling on them that they couldn't see, because like I said, they were already in the cab. So this is just one instance in Florida, and you can go look up your own city, the closest major city to you, and you'll find this same fate. You look at destruction from World War I, World War II, it looks exactly the same. So these weapons have been around for a long time. The biggest factor to 9-11 was the erasure of evidence. Erasing the evidence of the wrongdoings of the government, the financial institutions, you name it. You had evidence being destroyed. What do they call it? Jewish lightning. For lack of a better word, insurance fraud, destruction of evidence. Those two typically go hand in hand when we're talking about buildings falling down out of thin air. Seattle burned down, the downtown. Two months later, Ellensburg, which was at that time a major city in central Washington territory, burned down. Two months after that, Spokane, which was another major city on the eastern flank of the territory burned down. And when I discovered that, I just went, hold on a second. Like, there's something else entirely going on in the backstory. It's like they want to get rid of 
these beautiful structures. And some are still in use, but the ones that are inconvenient to the narrative, they just want gone. And there's also probably a component of the energy grid in all of this as well, because they keep what they can use, they keep what benefits them. And at some point they determine, okay, we don't need that anymore, for whatever the reason. Part of the story of the fires is that the fire chief wasn't in town at the time. He was away on some conference. And so the command structure was broken. So the mayor at the time in Seattle was the one that was calling shots. And he was making decisions that they should go in and make what they call fire breaks between buildings, meaning actually bringing dynamite into buildings and blowing them up. And that's acknowledged. And that's acknowledged in Boston, the Boston fire, in, in city after city, what's called a tactic to contain fires. And then they often say, well, look back and, you know, in retrospect, maybe it wasn't the best idea. Well, <laughs> what was causing these fires and what was causing this, this type of damage in the first place needs to be examined. So when you have a broken command structure and somebody else is calling the shots, that's really curious to me because that's the same thing that happened in Lahaina. The wildfires that swept through Maui are the deadliest in U.S. history in more than a century. On social media, people are speculating about what could have caused the fires. One trending theory is that the fires started due to an attack from a directed energy weapon. They're weapons like lasers that use energy fired at the speed of light to damage or destroy targets. According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, many countries, including the U.S., are researching their use. Yep, they flipped the police chief Pelletier, who was from the Vegas shooting. They made 10 emergency declarations all about Uncle Billy's and all about banding drive and all this stuff and to believe it or not the sunshine law where they removed the sunshine law or suspended it it wasn't in these 10 proclamations that they they are uh, really promoted and and really blew up all over all over the news it wasn't in any of them it was in this quiet little affordable housing act on the side truly it does look like only the places they wanted Safeway didn't get hit the gas stations didn't get hit. They knew what was going to go where. Uh, it's either they did it from the top with the laser energy weapon, like, uh, like others say, or it came from the bottom. But one thing was crazy is that over 24 hours later, they were still letting the fire burn. The fire was blowing so fast, the wind, it said it moved one mile in 10 seconds. I only think it, I would think in my head could move one mile in 10 seconds. You know, some kind of boom one time, the whole place. With the fires from Maui, I mean, I've got in my head, I've got, you know, these rows of cars that are just completely burned. Honestly, none of it looks like a fire. It looks like it's been destroyed with like some weapon or something fr from an angle. Just completely destroyed by a direct energy weapon. Just buildings sliced in half. You have melted cars, you have melted, everything. I mean, it just completely looks like a war zone. Send a laser from a directed energy weapon against the community and then step back and say, oh, that was natural or too bad, so sad. And all those people are left homeless and they don't get any help. And people aren't being allowed to get out of there. When it's happening, they're jumping in the water and poof, and everything looks like, you know, cars are burned out and people are going, whoa, what's going on here? And they're not getting any answers. And the current administration also has the slogan of build back better, which was the excuse given for these other great fires. Well, everything was wood. So look, look what we did. We built it back with this solid brick. I think what we're seeing now was never supposed to happen this quickly. I think all of these things were supposed to happen without us even being aware of it. I can only think, why else would, would you want to do that? You know, it gets rid of everything. There's no fingerprints. There's nothing. It's done. There's nobody to talk. Huh? They get rid of all the buildings. What stories is there to tell? His story is what they're going to tell. It's what they did tell us. Distorting a timeline laced with cover-ups and preventing public awareness of our own cities being destroyed. How powerful are these weapons? 
And when did they truly originate? So this frog should have turned to ash. It even has some ashes on the bottom. It's kind of gray. And it got a little bit on the edge of some heat, but it didn't contort it or anything. It's just perfectly symmetrical, petrified. And it seems mostly hollow, but the skin is totally solid and intact. There have been a lot of people that have been talking about the subject of meltology. And my take on that and other things is that's part of it, it's not all of it. And what I believe is that there was a directed energy attack on the Earth's grid system that blew out the grids. And that caused swamps, deserts, that caused land to just shear off and fall into the ocean. And that would have caused melted buildings as well. A really good example off the top of my head is a place called Red Rocks State Park in California. It looks melted. And there's other examples as well. So my belief is that there was just this massive surge of energy. So that surge of energy could have been from multiple sources and just went through the grid system and just blew everything out. When they came here, this was a destroyed and ruined landscape. And they even use the word ruins to describe things, but they push things far back in the past, like thousands of years or millions of years. And you know that was so far back, we don't know anything about that. The earth was terraformed by a highly advanced civilization. And so things we think of as mountains, like the Rocky Mountains and hills, are actually buildings. look at the city of San Francisco in the early 1870s and not a soul around. Vast emptiness with a fully intact city and nothing's out of place except that there's no people. And so what it looks like to me is they went into a city that was already there. jewels be visible somewhere on this map? Remember, from the World's Fair in San Francisco? It shouldn't be, because that was 37 years after this photograph was snapped. Oh, yes, of course. It looks like it's already there. With the World Fairs, it does seem that the purpose of them was to provide us with a new narrative and bring, bring the population to them, just overwhelm them with this fantastical realm that they were now going to internalize and then burn it down in almost like a ritualistic fashion to sear this into the consciousness of the people. The populating of the Americas was not as authentic, organic, as people might have been led to believe. There was a large system of what people have termed orphan trains, incubator baby farms. A lot of these were housed, hubbed in World's Fairs. You had incubator babies at the World's Fairs. Buy an Asian baby, buy a Filipino, buy an African baby. 
I think part of it was repopulation. I think part of it was early child trafficking. Premature children were in these incubators. You see pictures of these, you know, nurses and their uniforms in a room filled with baby incubators, with people paying admission. With our increased awareness today, you know, we've got things like Planned Parenthood and, and other things going on. There are companies that mail kids. There's, there's a bit on my business where somebody can place an order for a, for a child based on my color or whatnot, and they get delivered. That, that's not good. And I think it's the same idea that there's this harvesting of humans going on without our knowledge and awareness and unspeakable things happening to children that got its start very early on because the same families are behind it. And you would see this mass migration of orphan trains and orphan boats. And you're like, where, first of all, where are all these fucking orphans coming from? How, how many orphans were there in the 1800s? Why? So everybody's learning this thing at this young age and everybody has to go by these new set of structures and new set of rules. They have to learn this new history that everybody isn't really agreeing with. And then anybody that's not agreeing with, they have to go to the insane asylum. There is the orphan asylums for the children and the insane asylums for the adults. Now all of a sudden, John D. Rockefeller comes out with the Board of Education and all of the children are sent to a public schooling system to learn their new history. What better way to trick a society than to take their children at a young age and teach them exactly what you want them to know? If people just realize that if you don't understand the past, you'll repeat it over and over again. And it prevents people from going to progress in the future. And us as a collective species, we have to, we have to get to the nitty gritty of what really happened, what our true potential now is as a, as a collective civilization. Because we can't rely on those people anymore. How does any of us know, and I would ask my father this all the time, I would say, I would say, Dad, how do you know you have a great, 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 great grandpa? How do you know? None of us know it's the truth, you know? Those are things, and you know, people can sit there and say, you guys are off your rockers uh, talking about this stuff, but I mean, look who we're accepting the official story from. All I've ever known my whole life is that we don't know how we got here, and we don't know why, we don't know when. If Americans are sitting there one day and say, I don't know how I got here, I don't know why, and I don't know when, well then you've been reset. Don't believe what we say. Go out in your own communities and do your own research. There's plenty of buildings that they left for us to examine. Once we can all wake up collectively, then we can come to realize what they have truly done to us. Shout out Hibbler Productions. Check this old world order stuff out. Here you go, a true gem. Firm fam, 2024. Sift through the lies of indoctrination Ancient civilization laid to wasting More I scratch at the surface, more I'm facing Hidden no world, advanced not cavemen Free energy before the lies of the masons Flip the script and change the whole situation American cities found not created The tech of the giants, colossal creation What lies had they hid from us in plain sight The power of the ethos to feed them free life Structures weren't built by horse and buggies Huge slabs of stone masterful, not ugly 
old photos Sure marvels has been there Miles from quarries not anywhere near there Research the old world right now I declare we take it back our world From those who feed fear Yo it's that old world order The new world slaughter Don't drink the water Raise sons and daughters Teach them the truth Bless from the father And rip the chains right off us Yo it's that old world order The new world slaughter Don't drink the water Raise sons and daughters Teach them the truth Bless from the father And rip the chains right off us This is the age of Tataria Massive mud floods And real history Not the chronicles of Narnia, where the Tesla get his coil, sustained energy, not the Rockefeller's oil, who writes history the